So, welcome everybody to Second Morning, track two. Um, most of you who are from Wellington probably know what this thing is. These are super handy. I love them. Kirk helps with the technology that builds them. So without further ado, please welcome to the stage, Kirk. Cool, thank you, Misha. Uh, sorry I had a bit of a technology fail and, uh, and closed the Q&A. Uh, so the talk's probably gonna go to time, so if you wanna ask questions, just stick them in that URL and um, I should be able to answer them during the talk or um, after the talk, I can just reply to you. Cool, is that long enough for a URL to be on the screen? Okay, your browser wants you to be secure. Back in 1991, Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet as we know it. HTML, HTTP, I mean it was the, the culmination of several years of work for him, but in 1991, a mailing list post, he uh, put up some of the syntax for HTML. And these are the tags that I recognized from that original list although you don't see many definition lists these days. Um, and there was a bunch of other random tags that never really took off. Um, and, and this sort of started the internet revolution as we know it. 1993, Mosaic was released. That's this browser. I'm not actually running it. It's just a screenshot. Um, and uh, I don't even know if it would run on OS X. Uh, um, and they added the image tag, which was really good. Uh, if you wanted to put pictures in your document, and form so you could finally submit data back to the web server rather than just reading stuff. Then along came Netscape Navigator. Anyone remember this? Uh, what a piece of crap. Um, <laughs> so this was around 1994, and this was kind of when the, uh, the, the things we wanted to do on the internet outpaced what the browser could keep up with. Uh, and, uh, and also this is when browser vendors sort of started doing stuff without worrying about standards or specs and things like that, and those browser wars began. But there were some interesting things they did uh, in Netscape. Um, they, they created cookies, uh, encryption, um, programming language called Mocha, um, the document object model, and the same origin policy, and these are all really important stuff when it comes to security, because there's you know, logging into websites. Most websites use cookies to do this. You know, E-commerce and banking rely on encrypted uh, web traffic. Being able to do interactive applications, you've probably heard of Mocha. Um, I think it's gonna be a conference on about it soon. Um, and you know, security around like what page can access what other page. Um, you know, how do we make, um, how do we, <laughs> Uh, thanks for the photos. Um, how do we defend our applications against other things running in the same web browser? Um, and then they just kind of layered layers and layers of random stuff on top of it. And the browser vendors would invent things, they'd stick it on top of the stack, someone would come along and find a problem with something, rip it out, tear it up, they would glue it back together in some slightly less well-formed way and stick it on the top. And so, Browsers just became this kind of cobbled together collection of random things that uh, didn't always make sense. So for example, the same origin policy, which is where um, it's kind of like the definitions of what one web page can do to other pages in your browser or frames, um, is actually a bunch of different policies around DOM access, you know, uh, AJAX requests, web storage access, cookie access, um, the, the different plugins, and they all have different rules. And it's so crazy that uh, this really awesome book, which I recommend you read, if you're interested in the sort of history and why we are where we are in web security, takes 320 pages to pretty much explain the differences between all these and the history and how we got there. Um, it's from 2011, but it's still, I think, pretty relevant today. Um, so, uh, so something about the slides, um, I'll put the slides online um, with all the links. It's gonna take me a while to copy all the links out of the slides and put them onto the page, but um, I'll do it this afternoon. Um, so you don't need to write down URLs. Uh, so now 2017, we're in a better place. Browsers are, I don't know, cooler. 
uh, something. Um, and, uh, and the focus is really less about uh, individual features that browsers want to develop to distinguish themselves and more about making the users who use the browsers secure and protecting them. Uh, but this talk's just a snapshot as at today uh, because these things move fast. And also, I've got a bit of a bias towards Chrome, um, but that's mainly because I use Chrome. Um, but all the browsers provide pretty similar features, and they so sort of leapfrog each other. Um, but on the whole, uh, they're reasonably similar. So why do I have a bias towards Chrome? Well, in 2002, I started using this browser called Phoenix. And this was great because they'd taken Netscape Communicator, which had like an email client and a mail reader, a newsgroup reader, um, and all this other bloat. Um, and they'd stripped it back to just this really fast web browser. Um, and then Phoenix turned into Firebird because Phoenix Technology Corporation didn't like a browser being called Phoenix. And then Firebird uh, changed into Firefox because the Firebird database guys didn't like a browser being called Firebird. Um, and I was really happy with Firebox, Firefox. I had tab browser. Um, you know, it was fast. It was so much faster than um, the other browsers. Uh, but then in 2008, uh, this other browser launched. Um, and when they launched, they had this comic about uh, why Chrome was different and what was different about Chrome. Does anyone re remember reading this in 2008? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and I was like, wow, I didn't realize that all the other browsers sucked. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, even though you make your business based on advertising and I'll be selling my soul, I'm going to use your browser now. Um, and so I did, and that is when I became a, a Chrome convert. Um, one of the cool things that Chrome pioneered was sandboxing, which is this idea that uh, browsers of the day were having lots of security issues with like flash plugins crashing and you know, infecting computers with malware and things like um, attacking your operating system. And so they started putting uh, different web pages into different actual operating system processes. And instead of running those processes with full permissions to your whole computer, uh, they restricted them to just a small amount of access. So even if something managed to crash the sandbox, uh, it would have to escape that um, jail, effectively, in order to do anything bad. And the other browsers have kind of done stuff like this now as well. Um, here's another thing justifying why um, I'm allowed to talk about mostly Chrome-specific stuff, even though I'm talking about browsers in general. And that's because browsers in general are on a downward trajectory. It's, it's sad. Uh, so uh, as I was saying, uh, the, the goal of browser manufacturers these days is to make things as safe as possible for their users. Uh, so we'll be talking about things to protect the browser users themselves. We'll be talking about things that protect our web applications. Um, and it's kind of like a mergy, blurry bit um, where the stuff that protects the users actually makes our web apps more secure. Um, and the idea is to hopefully give you uh, a bunch of background. I'm going to race through some of it. And then you can go and drill into individual things if, they think they, if you think they make sense for your app. Uh, so there's our user using the internet. Uh, their browser is talking to a server. It's a pretty good architecture diagram. I think you'll agree. Uh, there's a bad guy. So uh, these pictures are courtesy of my daughter. Um, she thinks that um, superheroes with Visa cards are about the worst thing that could happen to you on the internet. <laughs> um, and he's trying to steal stuff from our lovely person. Uh, also, she doesn't like drawing hands um, or feet. Um, <laughs> So, protecting users. So the first set of stuff is going to be uh, sort of user-based. So the biggest risk attack against users today is attacking the operating system um, underneath the browser. That's what the bad guys are trying to do. They're trying to get malware installed, drive by when you, you know, browse a website, you view some advertisements, they install some crap on your computer, and then profit. Um, so the browser manufacturers have a serious commitment uh, to protecting the operating system from the browser. Uh, Chrome's paid out a million dollars <throat> in vulnerability rewards last year. Microsoft's top reward is $200,000 US, which is a little bit more than I earn. Um, and uh, I think this is a Microsoft strategy, which basically to make it really difficult to exploit things and eliminate entire classes of vulnerabilities. 
Um, so yeah, that's good money. Luckily, they've got lots of money, so it's easy for them to pay that. Um, so the first is PDFs. So uh, Acrobat Reader is something you should never have installed on your computer. Um, and Firefox and Chrome have built built-in PDF viewers now. Uh, I think Firefox is JavaScript-based. Um, and they cut down the feature set of PDFs to just a safe-ish set. I mean, they've still had security issues in their own viewers, uh, but you know, Acrobat Reader allows you to embed uh, 3D Autodesk models inside a PDF and Flash movies, and it lets you run JavaScript, and if the JavaScript runs on your desktop, it can access the rest of your desktop, and all this kind of crazy stuff. Um, so you know, the Chrome and Firefox viewers are much, much safer. And they've also been working with the, uh, with the vendors, so like Adobe and other plugin vendors, uh, to fuzz their plugins and make the vendors make them secure. Uh, safe browsing, so this is a service where your website eventually ends up on it and you go, why can no one browse my website anymore? Uh, so Google have a safe browsing service where they track uh, known bad websites, so websites that have had malicious stuff on them before. Microsoft have something similar called Smart Screen, and every time you visit a page, effectively, um, your browser is checking to make sure it's safe. Um, they do it, both of them are slightly different in how they do it. Uh, blocking malicious advertisements. So basically viewing advertisements on the internet is probably the most dangerous thing that a regular internet user will do as they're browsing around. Um, and this is a really great visualization of 132% growth in uh, malvertising in, from 2015 to 2016, because like that circles, uh, yeah, anyway, it's a bad visualization. But basically mal malvertising's on the rise. Um, and uh, and Superhero says you should install an ad blocker like uBlock Origin. Um, there's not really any safe way to use the internet without it. Um, I wanted to focus on things that browsers do for you, but unfortunately, one of the browsers I really like is incentivized uh, to make me want to look at ads, but I still don't want to do it, so they don't bundle ad blocking in in their browser. Uh, disabling plugins. Um, so uh, the manufacturer has done a lot of work to separate plugins into their own sandbox processes. That's taken longer than uh, everyone expected it would take because. Uh, some companies are not as good as Google, um, but the safest thing to do is just disable the plugins altogether. Um, you can get around the internet without having Java enabled these days. Um, browser extensions. So this is actually uh, another place where users are at risk because browser extensions have a lot more access. Um, so you know. You, your browser extension can access every tab in your browser and look at every cookie in every tab. So potentially they could log into your internet banking just by taking that cookie. Um, so you have to be really careful which browser extensions you install. Luckily, I only have about 43 browser extensions, and I've looked at the source code of about two of them. Um, so I'm trusting them a lot. And uh, the browser vendors kind of trying to have the safe ecosystem for browser extensions. Um, but then weird things happen, like uh, I can't remember which ad blocking one it was that got bought by evil people um, and then became evil, um, and all their existing users got eviled on. Um, incognito mode. This is a browser feature that's not really a security feature because all it really does is hide your dodgy website stuff, and it doesn't even do that very well because uh, there's not really any way to really hide what you're doing, so that's not really a security feature. Um, password storage. So the basic thing here is anytime your computer can automatically get your password and put it into a web page, anything running on your computer can automatically get your password and put it on a web page. Uh, so be careful about whether you trust um, browser password storage. Uh, people freaked out when they realized that in the Chrome settings they could just go into save passwords and view their saved passwords. Like, oh my god, my browser actually lets me look at my passwords that it will type in automatically. But when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Um, browser manufacturers are trying to do better at storing your passwords in a more secure way. Uh, one of them is Smart Lock from Google, which I haven't really looked at because I don't really trust anyone with my passwords. Um, I use a password safe instead of the browser. 
Um, so now let's look at attacks where one site, like site B, attacks site A. So you're, you're browsing to both sites on your computer. How can the browsers protect against these kind of attacks? Uh, so these are attacks on basically against that same origin policy where a browser, uh, sorry, a website of one origin, example.com, is trying to access a website of another origin, evil.com, because um, you're viewing both of them in your browser. Uh, so historically, there's been a lot of these kind of attacks, and hopefully you've seen some of these in various talks or research you've done, uh, such as cross-site scripting, click jacking, frame hijacking. These are all attacks where one thing's trying to attack another thing. Uh, so just a, a brief um, run-through of how cross-site scripting works. Uh, so Deadpool puts some script onto a web server. Uh, maybe he enters it into a forum comment or as his first name. And then um, our nice person, when they're using their computer, they browse that same website and the script runs on their computer. Uh, so browsers have tried a lot of different... No, not really a lot of... They've, they've done a mediocre effort of trying to stop cross-site scripting attacks. Uh, so IE8... Um, introduced the XSS filter, which was if there was some JavaScript in the URL, it wouldn't let it run on the page as well, uh, which stopped reflected XSS. Um, and Chrome also has the XSS auditor. Um, and so in your app, Deadpool says, I'm allowed to say that, it's a copyright name, I don't know. Uh, Pull Dead says, um, use the XSS protection header um, and pop that in your web apps. Um, and there's some links to go look at the, the details. Um, and there's also a new, oh, it's not really new, five years old content security policy. And this is where your website says, these are the only places you can get JavaScript to run on, inside my uh, web app. Um, these are the only places you can load images from. Uh, these are the only plugins you can load, that sort of thing. Um, if you're starting a Greenfield app, please try and turn this on straight away. If you're, starting, uh, if you're starting work at a company with a 10-year-old app, um, it's going to be harder, um, but it's worth giving it a go um, if you like masochism. Um, so Cross-site request forgery is another kind of issue. Um, so a public domain image of a cookie goes from the user's computer to a server. Um, every time they go to any page on that site and the cookie identifies them. Um, and that cookie basically logs them in. Um, so a cross-site request forgery attack is when you go and visit someone else's website, um, and that website says, hey, redirect to this page, and your browser goes, yeah, sure, and I'll pass my cookie along, um, and then the attack is that the, the evil website is able to redirect you to something they want you to do, not necessarily what you wanted to do, but your browser just nicely logs you in. And this is a flaw in that 1994 design of how cookies work, um, that different websites can instruct your browser to do things on a, th on a third website, and your cookies get passed along with it. Um, so these are a kind of ambient property where you know, they just go automatically, um, and same origin policy is weak. So there's some things you should do. Um, there's a new cookie type uh, called same site cookies, you shove that on the end, and then third-party sites, um, when they redirect you or post forms or whatever from their page, your cookies won't go across. So turn that on. Um, I don't know, remember what I was supposed to say here. Uh, oh, yeah, so yeah, when you've got the same site cookies on, you know, your cookie that would normally work from your browser, when the bad guy redirects you, it doesn't get sent. Um, there's, there's a picture. Um, apparently, there's a thousand words wrapped up in that. Um, so there's two other cookie flags that you probably use a lot, secure and HTTP only. So only send cookies over encrypted connections. Don't let JavaScript access them. And there's these two new things which are called cookie prefixes, which strengthen the guarantees um, so that your cookie can only be sent to your host, uh, not subdomains. So turn those two on as well. Uh, so frames, frames can communicate, sites can communicate between frames, um, and you can turn that off for your site by setting the same origin header. Um, Jen also did a talk at KiwiCon. I put a link to the research she was referring to about the no opener attribute that you can put on all your links going out to external sites. Uh, so you need to go through your entire website and fix all external links to have that on there. Um, otherwise, 
uh, bad things will happen. Um, but so I'm a user and I want to be secure. How do I actually make it so that when I'm browsing banking, Facebook can't attack my banking session? Well, the naive approach and the approach taken by government departments is that you're only allowed to do work stuff on work computers and you're only allowed to do personal stuff on personal computers. But that doesn't really work uh, these days because everyone's carrying around a computer that does both. Um, and we need to leverage sandboxing. Um, and one approach I'd like you to think about is using browser profiles. So probably if you are like many people, your browser profiles are like this. You just have the one browser profile you use for everything. Uh, consider putting a separate profile for each sensitive task you do. So one for your banking, uh, one for your production environment, one for your dev environment. And then um, you just switch between them like they're windows um, in your browser, but the cookies, the processes that run on the operating system, everything is completely separated. Um, so you've got quite strong protection from you know, something that you're doing personally browsing around the web, attacking your production EC2 instances. Uh, so here's an example. My banking browser profile just has the two banks that I owe money to in it, um, and I don't do anything else in there. Um, you can uh, set up each profile differently, so maybe don't put all 42 extensions when you're browsing your banking website. Um, and I made this little extension called AWS only, which I use when I'm browsing AWS, so that if I accidentally type another URL in it, um, it won't let me go to it. Um, and you can install that, or you can probably write better JavaScript than I can and make your own. Um, so networking. So we had that picture of our person browsing the internet, but Paul Dead wants to look at stuff as it's traveling. So I've got 174 certificate authorities in my browser that someone says I should trust. Um, unfortunately, we just have to trust these certificate authorities. They say if a website is secure, but is it really secure? I mean, all that padlock means is that no one can listen in uh, to my conversation with the web server, um, and it kind of links the website to the domain name. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we have to trust CAs, um, and they have kind of a um, financial model that doesn't encourage trust. Their financial model is ship as many certificates for as much money as possible. But luckily, the browser vendors hold them to account. So uh, there's been several issues which you can read uh, by clicking the links later on the talk, where browser vendors have basically said to these people that sell certificates, you can't do that anymore. Uh, we're not going to support your certificates in our browsers. Um, and it's even big ca companies like Symantec that get slapped for this. So um, we have the browsers defending us there. Um, you can also try and find out if any of those 174 certificate authorities are issuing certificates for your um, own website. Um, you can sign up to uh, this Facebook thing, which is free, um, type in your domain name, and every time a new uh, web a certificate is registered, I think you get like a Facebook message or something like that. I don't really know how Facebook works. Um, or you can it's probably post it to your wall or something. I don't know, pokes you. Um, and then Certificate Spotter um, is a slightly paid service um, where they'll do something similar. Uh, but encryption's hard. Uh, browser vendors lead the charge in removing insecure protocols, encryption algorithms. Um, Google had pretty much hammered out, uh, got rid of SHA-1 before SHA-1 became dead last month. Um, and there's a free tool that you should use on your website called SSL Labs, um, which will give you a score. And you basically just work through the checklist and make your web servers uh, A. Five minutes already. Um, so, uh, so do that. Your, your customers do it anyway. It's really annoying when they email you and say you get a B plus, fix it. Like, oh, thanks, customer. Um, you can uh, make your web server force HTTPS by including a header that says never talk to me on HTTP. If you're especially keen, you can tell all web browsers to only accept certain certificates um, by putting them in um, your headers. Um, and if your website uses HTTP2, then the browser manufacturers decided that even though the spec said you didn't have to encrypt your traffic, they're going to force everyone to anyway. So they're mandating encryption. The another problem users have is actually understanding the errors, and this is also where the browser manufacturers are trying to help. 
Um, so users don't really understand stuff and they don't know whether they should follow the advice and they don't know if they're under attack. And the Google researcher, um, APF, uh, Adrian, I think her name is, um, has published a bunch of work about understandability of error messages. Um, here's some examples of different error messages you get in different browsers, and they're baffling, and it's color-based, and who knows what they mean. Um, and actually, it turns out that only a real small percentage of things are actual attacks, and a lot of the certificate errors people get are because their clock's wrong, or they're at school, or the government is evil, things like that, that they have no way of defending against, and apart from, I guess, leaving the US, um, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so another thing that browsers are doing is discouraging unencrypted web pages. So this is Chrome uh, before and after. Now if you go to a login page, or you go to a page with credit card details, it'll actually say, not secure. Um, so, you know, we used to tell users to check for a padlock. Uh, now the browser is trying to make that a bit more explicit. Okay, so protecting your apps. So I actually put a whole bunch of things that you should do on your apps earlier. So when I got to this section, there was less stuff to put. Uh, but there's a couple of bits that didn't fit in earlier. Uh, so uh, instead of talking about the whole thing, we're just talking about things your server can do. Um, so one is this referrer policy. So did you know that every time someone clicks on a link from your site to another site, it passes the page URL of your site to that site. Yeah, ev everyone kind of knows that. That's how you find out which search results link to you and stuff like that. Um, but if you make a page on your site like dumb things our competitors are doing um, and then link to their blog post, turns out they get the URL, my, you know, yoursite.com slash dumb things your competitors are doing in their web server logs, and then they ring up your CEO and ask why, and it's really embarrassing. Um, so um, you can turn off uh, referrers, and you can also um, say only send the host name of the URL, not the full query string, which is really good if you've got sensitive stuff in your query string. So look into that. Uh, Sub-resource integrity, when you include someone else's JavaScript library, how do you know it's not going to change? Do you trust these people called Googliappies? I mean, uh, they might change jQuery to do any kind of really bad thing. Um, so what you can do is you can download it, you can read the source code for uh, jQuery, um, minified, um, and then you can make a hash of it, and you can say to the browser, only download this jQuery library and run it if the hash matches what I have actually checked. Um, as I said, this is just a snapshot of things as they are today. It's the 10th of March. Google will probably release something tomorrow. Firefox will leapfrog them, and then Internet Explorer will follow up three years later. Um, and, um, and things are changing, and we need to constantly go back to our old apps and add these protections in um, to try and protect our users. Uh, future things that are coming, uh, mixed content is uh, controlling whether HTTP images can show on an HTTPS web page, uh, giving you some more flexibility around that and more explicit. Clear site data is really cool. Um, that's coming up. You know when someone logs out of your website, you have to set a cookie that's dated in the past that has nothing in it to make the current cookie go away? Like, what the hell, 1994? Um, so the clear site data thing says to the browser, drop all cookies for my site, clear your cache, and a bunch of other configurable things. So when someone logs out of your site, you can actually blow everything out of their browser. Uh, Sub-Origins is a, about applying security stuff to parts of your website. Um, and there's a whole bunch more stuff that's coming up. Um, these people I really enjoy following on Twitter. Um, so Adrienne, um, she's in the Chrome usability uh, team working on usable security. Uh, she's a really good uh, person to follow. Eric Law, um, he created Fiddler. He works for Chrome now, Mike West. Um, Scott Helm, I've put a lot of links because I think he does really understandable blog posts on what all these security headers are. Um, I've got the link to this talk, so you don't need to write them all down. Um, that's the book that I think you should buy. I bought it twice, whoops. Um, so my talk will be up on hack minus education. Um, it wasn't supposed to come out like that. Um, and so you'll get all those links. Um, we're running a web security conference for free in Auckland on the 20th of April. Uh, we have a diversity and financial assistance fund if you find it hard 
um, and we'd really like people who wouldn't normally come to our conference to come with the assistance of that, so please do apply. Uh, we run a meetup in Wellington, uh, there's also one in Auckland and Christchurch, um, which is more regular. Um, and if you really like security stuff, I am on time. Uh, if you really like security stuff, um, the Risky Business Podcast is a weekly roundup of security news with a little bit of Unix beards and giggles um, thrown in. Uh, so that's been my talk. Um, hit me up for questions afterwards. Thank you very much.